Joining Char, they have a glimpse into marketing's future. From AdAge, here's Simon Domenko, Adelphic, Jennifer Lum, and from Rough Draft Ventures, please welcome Peter Boyce. Moderating the panel is Trillia's Cindy Stockwell. Karen, in her opening, um, talked about curated brand experiences. Shar, I think you gave some really interesting rules or guidelines for brands to follow. And I think in both those cases, it's about think beyond channels and think about the whole experience and how to program for that whole experience um, in a way that kind of works for your, your consumers. So with that in mind, as we look ahead to 2020, and we look ahead to the next few years, what are the kinds of things that brands should be testing into or trying to kind of reach that consumer of the future in a way that is going to be in line with what they're actually looking for? I'm going to ask kind of anybody who wants to jump in on that one. Otherwise, I'll call on you. <laughs> Now? Yeah, let's do this one. Oh, now. Now it's working? A little bit? No. no. <laughs> this one's no good. <laughs> no worries. Um, so just really quick, um, you know, when we think about brand building, you know, we're lucky to be investors in companies like uh, Honest Company and Warby Parker and Outdoor Voices. Um, you know, two things come to mind, I think. Number one, the fact that the sources of trust, I think, are changing. And so as folks kind of look to friends in their network, uh, Instagram and kind of other places as kind of sources of authority. Um, as you're thinking about building a brand, I think that changes the equation a bit. Um, and then the second piece, which, which may seem a little bit less scalable, but I think is nonetheless really important, is, um, is community building, right? And so whether that happens online or offline, but um, I think the, the loyalty and the kind of relationship that brands can build with groups and individuals um, is really important. So we think about brands uh, focusing on both. Um, one thing that I think is interesting to think about is this notion of zero UI. So I think Shar spoke about this a little bit, but um, as you see these new devices coming online and you see new modes of um, human-computer interaction um, on the rise, such as voice and audio and gesture and touch versus typing on a keyboard, um, it's an interesting opportunity to think about how you can design and create new experiences for brand engagement and um, new ways to allow consumers to interact with your brand throughout the day, regardless of the device. You know, voice can activate services on your phone, soon to be on the TV, um, on a digital billboard. Um, so I think that's a really interesting topic to think about. I'm really interested in chaos management uh, in testing new technologies, by which I mean that, uh, you know, with the recent internet of things, um, chaos that was unleashed, shutting down lots of sites on the East Coast and spiraling through the rest of the country. Um, I think that brands and uh, marketers and agencies are going to have to keep a very close watch on how these uh, technologies actually impact users, not only in kind of test situations, but like what can happen when the virus gets unleashed, when the uh, you know connected toaster uh, you know uh, blows up. Um, so that's kind of what I'm looking at is um, not only testing things, but testing the repercussions of the worst case scenarios, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, I, I mentioned, I'm, I think I'm on, right? Yep. I mentioned during my presentation that I think um, we're entering a, a period where brands focus on demonstrating their brand promise rather than just communicating it. And I think that means uh, potentially a shift in terms of what is considered brand investment. So you think about Under Armour, for example, investing in mobile infrastructure in order to create utilities that demonstrate the brand promise of making athletes better. It's not just about communicating, we have cute clothes, but it's actually about providing utilities that will help a runner run smarter or build equipment that have analytics in there that will help a runner run healthier. And I think that's a very interesting shift in terms of um, a brand investing in something that is not traditional branding, but is all focused on this notion of demonstrating what the brand promises. 
So you both, talk, both um, Simon and Shar, you talk, talked about um, kind of the Internet of Things to a certain extent, right? And um, what's going to happen when more and more and more data is being generated and more and more people are getting concerned about that data and the, um, their ability to control that? Is that something that we're going to see some backlash on in the future? Yeah, uh, I, yeah I think your, your mic is working. I'm back on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, I do think that there's going to be uh, you know, a kind of managing expectations problem and a managing repercussions problem. Um, I saw a tweet recently uh, that I'm going to quote here from a user named Pin, uh, Pinboard. Um, total random speculation. Uh, ISIS hackers could break into your smart oven and make it unevenly heat your calzone, causing you to burn your mouth. Maybe they already have. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I do think that there's going to be rising kind of distrust and worry, and I also think that lots of brands are just not positioned to handle this. You know, like we talk about brands that have crises using crisis communication. Maybe they use their existing agency to do crisis communications, or maybe they hire a specialist in crisis communications. But I think that's going to have to be baked into the process of testing these new technologies, because I think that, um, you know, certainly with the Internet of Things example that we saw recently, uh, security is not built into the system. So there's, you know, you know, millions of products that are in the market now from baby monitors to maybe connected ovens uh, that um, are in households now spewing data uh, and connecting with the internet and they're not necessarily secure. And I think that's something that, um, you know, brands have to get the jump on in terms of managing where that goes, basically. Yeah. Right. Um, Jennifer, you mentioned um, uh, voice generation and voice activation and sort of in that way AI and um, where do you see that, you know, brands I think right now are starting to experiment in there and some I think are doing some really interesting things, especially in sort of reservation and customer service and those areas. Talk a few years out, where do you see that technology kind of impacting us as marketers? Um, so with more and more products and services uh, coming online in a connected manner. I think one of the big um, uh, sort of shifts forward looking a few years out is that service delivery is going to become much more of a uh, passive experience for the consumers, meaning that I'm not going to need to reach out and call or ask for everything that I want on demand, right? AI will enable brands and service providers to understand and predict when I want something, how I want to receive it, um, and, and um, how I will likely engage with that uh, most effectively. Um, so, so I think that, that goes beyond voice, but again, going back to just HCI in general. Um, so it, it, it's, you know, it, so many years uh, from a, a design um, standpoint of UX and U UI has been spent on thinking about how do I minimize the number of clicks to get the user to do this, right? What's the most aesthetically pleasing from a visual perspective way I can color this button or design this button? Um, so I think we need to start thinking a lot deeper um, and thinking about just the user and where are they, what are the connected devices that are around them, and how do I best design my service um, for engagement and activation? Did you have something you wanted to add? I was going to say, just yeah. to kind of tie these uh, two points yeah. together, um, you know, I think the design and kind of convenience serve as a proxy for trust. And so if you think about designing elegant experiences that ultimately save people time and give them a really great, uh, great experience, whether it's on their mobile device or with a consumer product, I mean, if you think back five or seven years ago, uh, we, were, we would be so uncomfortable with the notion of you know, sharing your location every moment that you're in your car, right? But yeah. Waze made it super elegant, super simple, and returned a tremendous amount of value. And so thinking about you know, whether it's more kind of like IoT and other sources of information, so it's kind of design, conveniency is kind of at the core of it. I think there's, there's huge potential for us to leverage. Yeah, I agree. Um, sticking with you, Peter, you work with college entrepreneurs. And um, so I think you're seeing probably a lot of really interesting uses of technology and a lot of probably very forward thinking um, ways to kind of help consumers, help people live their lives better. Do you want to talk about anything really interesting that you're seeing right now that you think is going to affect us in the future? Totally. So I'll talk about kind of like one of the, the enabling pieces of this, which I think is, is relevant for all of us in the room, which is 
the, the tools of kind of creation, creating software, creating brands is becoming more and more democratized. And so what you can accomplish as a, as a young person, a college student, or a recent grad in your dorm room with $100 and AWS credit is you know, uh, completely you know, uh, kind of uh, in stark contrast to what you could have tried to have done a few years ago. Um, and so we see more creativity, we see more innovation, I mean, we see more you know, folks thinking that they can kind of take it upon themselves to reinvent an industry. And so we see a few things. Uh, I think mobile, mobile kind of communities are really important for folks. So you know, what does the world look like in a, in a post-Facebook or uh, a kind of a complementary Facebook environment? So you see Evan Spiegel from Snapchat having kind of pioneered that his way. Um, and so we see a lot of that. Two is we also see folks taking on more bold and ambitious ideas that aren't necessarily just focused on consumers. And so whether that's leveraging the Microsoft Connect to create you know, kind of a new analytics platform for, you know, uh, for TV ratings and for viewing ratings uh, to kind of you know, serve as a complement for something like Nielsen. Um, we see student entrepreneurs basically being kind of unbounded in what they can accomplish because the tools for creation have become so affordable and so accessible. So I think technology and then the sharing economy has disrupted a ton of industries, right? So think about transportation, think about um, housing and um, um, hospitality. And I think, Shar, when we spoke earlier, you talked about a study that Forrester had done that really looked forward um, a few years and said, what are the causes of disruption and what are the maybe some of the industries that might be ripe for disruption in the future. I'd love for you to talk about that for a minute. Sure, so, so we're always trying to think a little bit about in the face of this disruption, what do you do? How do you plan? And how urgently uh, do you approach this priority compared to the other things that you also have to deal with? So um, like any good consultant, a two by two can, can be a very helpful framework here. And I'll just suggest that our framework is um, an urgency and an importance axis. So the urgency axis is how urgent is a change to your business? So we could take the change to post-digital. How urgently does that need to be something that you pursue? And think a little bit about the mobile personality of your customer. Do you have a highly mobile audience that is expecting things in moment, in context, at their moment of need? Think also a little bit about your competitor moves. Do you have aggressive competitors who are responding to disruption also? And then think a little bit about the importance index. And this might also affect you based on your competitive moves, but it might be something that is um, not, as, not as dynamic. So something that is about an ability for you to express what your brand stands for differently because of a uh, new technology. Um, this might also be something that's based on um, how uh, industry regulation and how this might affect the way that you are treating changing regulatory issues in your, in your market. So if we think about that, you can kind of plot, use that matrix to plot any of the decisions that you're thinking about prioritizing. But when we think about it associated with technology disruption, we tend to find that the industries that are most poised for disruption and most able to accommodate disruption are companies like in, in the retail, consumer goods, and travel space. Then companies that are poised for disruption and less able or ready to respond to disruption tend to be telecommunications, transportation, and financial services firms. And then other industries are less ripe for disruption. It doesn't mean that it's not coming, it just means that it's less urgent in, in our overall two by two. So if you're in um, utilities, healthcare, uh, some manufacturing, some high tech, your industries are less urgent, and that just gives you a little bit more lead time to start preparing for some of these post-digital disruptions that we're talking about. That's great. And um, as we all prepare for, I think, this, um, you know, if each one of you were to say to a CMO, like, what is the one thing that you would have, what you would be testing this year? And I know it's probably gonna change by industry, but if you had, like, one thing that you said to a CMO, what would you be testing this year in 2017? to kind of look ahead to the future? Well, I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'd obviously encourage a CMO to put more money to work in mobile. Yeah. Um, I think the obvious reason is just given uh, the consumer consumption of, of mobile media. But I think um, equally as important, if not more important, I think mobile um, devices are um, a critical 
um, mechanism for learning about consumers throughout their waking day. And um, you know, even when a mobile device isn't actively being used, it's on the consumer, right? If they're awake, their mobile's with them. And it's a great way of uh, learning about not only their sort of physical proximity and commuting through the day, but how they interact with other connected devices. While they're watching their TV, what is it that they're doing on their phone? Um, while they're walking down the street, while they're in the subway and they're, they're walking by a, a digital out of home billboard, what's happening? So think of mobile and, and mobile data as a great way of learning how to connect the dots of consumer behavior across different channels and different contexts. And, and use that data for marketing um, in general, not just yeah. to inform mobile marketing buzz. So you talked about mobile data, but one quick follow-up is, you know, when you think about the screen and you think about time spent, um, that screen is really dominated by three players, right? So Google, Facebook, and Apple. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, is anybody else going to be able to break into that screen? Is that sort of, you know, the we should be, you know, if we don't already have relationships with those three companies, we should definitely be doubling down on them. What's your feeling about that? It's a good question. Um, so I think uh, you know there's a, there's still a few activities that happen um, at uh, decent volume outside of those yep. those three uh, platforms or those three walls, right? Search. Mm -hmm. Well, that's Google. Often. Uh, sure. Not always, but often. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I think th this, this, but going back to the, the voice yeah. space, the voice space notion yeah. of like, who's going to control that? Yeah. Will it be Apple? Will it be Google? Will yeah. it be Amazon? Right. Right. Um, uh, yeah, I think Amazon's a big player in that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so absolutely. the, the um, I think the, the other important thing to think about is which of these three platforms which of them are actually uh, providing you with access to your data? Hmm. Um, because data in general is going to be the most valuable thing that marketers control yeah. going forward. Yeah. Um, so uh, right now, a lot of money is pouring into some of these platforms. Very little data is coming back out to make you smarter and to help you understand your, your customers. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a fight for the third party publishers. It's a fight for independent platforms. Yeah. Um, but uh, we're, we're a big believer in uh, the future of, of cross-platform. Yeah. Car, Simon? Um, I would just add that if I were talking about CMO investing and stuff, I, I come from a media background, so yeah. I've been effectively kind of covering the political stuff that's been going on. Um, I would invest in demographic research. Um, it's kind of an off-to-the-side question, but when we talk about disrupting industries, we're talking about disrupting, you know, in the transportation industry alone with self-driving cars and trucks, millions of people. Yeah. And their demographics are going to shift dramatically. So when we talk about this Trump America versus Clinton America divide, that's only get, going to get more and more uh, dramatic, regardless of what happens in the election. Um, and that's something that really uh, matters um, to you know, how you deploy your marketing resources if you're potentially going to lose an entire chunk of your uh, consumer because they don't have jobs in an automated economy anymore. Mm -hmm. I have a very, very simple strategy, which is called Kids These Days, um, <laughs> which is to spend more time with, you know, the, the, the young kind of college students and recent grads that are either going to be your consumers down the, down the road, they're going to be, you know, amazing young, young leaders in your, in your company. Um, or they're going to found companies that work alongside and kind of like, you know, help define the forefront of your industry. And so finding opportunities to kind of collaborate and share information earlier, just given how quickly everything is moving, uh, to kind of form those alliances earlier on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say invest in understanding emotions of your users. And that's, um, it's not as in vogue as it once was, but... 95% um, of the decisions that we make are made for irrational reasons, emotional reasons. That's an HBS stat, not a Forrester stat. Um, and so I think that means that the research that focuses on understanding what are some of those irrational motivations, maybe this is neural marketing, that stuff is getting more scalable, but maybe it's just trying to watch how people actually behave and understanding some of the um, irrational elements that provoke decisions, I ultimately think is going to weigh more heavily than some of the other science that you might be applying. Irrational decisions like how some people might vote. Right? Exactly. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. All right. I'm being told we have to wrap up. So I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to wrap up. So kids, data, um, 
demographics, yes. demographics. and behavior. Right? Emotion. Emotion. Emotion which drives behavior. All right, thank you so much. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>